My purpose in appearing before you today is to give you some account of the Arctic regions, particularly that portion which I have visited. Every person of ordinary observation and intelligence has some appreciation of the beauties and wonders of nature. We are all, except for the hopelessly dull and soulless, affected by the rising sun, the starry heavens, the ocean, the mountains, great rivers and forests. But I am about to take you into scenery and show you sights which will be strange indeed to most of you. Every American, at least every North American, is familiar with winter scenery, wastes of snow, frozen rivers and lakes. But in our temperate climes, winter does not attain the awful grandeur of the polar regions, in which ice mountains and frozen torrents are perennial, and the solitudes immense, unbroken, awful. Thought itself is arrested in the presence of nature of such sublimity. The reality surpasses the flights of imagination. All is novel, impressive, astonishing. The scene was wild and strange. A summer sun was pouring down with an intensity that rendered overcoats superfluous. Away on the left stretched the everlasting hills, bleak, brown and barren, showing no sign of vegetation, the gorges and ravines filled with the impacted ice and snows of past ages, and their summits crowned with a glistening coronet that in the distance sparkled with the gleam of frosted silver. Not a breath of air was stirring, and the deep blue of an arctic sky was reflected in the water, strangely flecked with indescribable icy forms. None of the bergs around us were very large, but no two were alike, and as the panther moved rapidly between and among them, the scene could be compared to nothing but the quickly changing views of the kaleidoscope. The charm of color was there, too, with all its beauty and variety, from dead white to glossy, glistening satin, from the most delicate to the darkest tints of the emerald, from faint blue to deepest lapis lazuli. Now some lofty berg would come between us and the sun, and its crest would be bordered with an orange-colored halo in which prismatic shades and tints burst out like a glory. The wild, rugged shapes of these masses baffle all description. Nothing but the sun-given powers of the camera can do them justice, and even that must fail in part, for until retouched by hand, the glorious phases of color remain unexpressed. There is ample scope for the imagination to picture things of wonderful shape and outline strange to behold. It may be the resemblance to gigantic men, mountains, beasts, towers, steeples, crenellated castles, or humbler cottages by the sea. After a sail of about 36 hours, we made the small islands lying a few miles away from the island of Disco, where we were to stop a short time in the harbor of Godhaven in latitude 69 degrees. On account of the various exploring expeditions in search of Sir John Franklin, as well as all the whalers making this a place of call, it is probably better known to the general reader than any other place in Greenland. The Eskimo kayakers are very expert and perform some feats which astonish all those who see them. One feat in particular seems almost incredible, but having repeatedly witnessed its performance, I can vouch for the fact. The man turns a somersault underwater while seated in his boat, just as one of our acrobats does on land. The kayak, or man's boat, is constructed in the same manner as the woman's, but is of different shape and model. Both umiak and kayak are always made by the women, who in this matter are somewhat ahead of their civilized sisters. We carefully scanned the rocky cliffs with our glass and saw unmistakable signs of previous glacial action, which is remarkable as there's no glacier within five or six miles of these cliffs. On the left was a precipitous wall 4,000 feet in height, similar to El Capitan in the Yosemite Valley, while on the right was another which in form and height would readily suggest Glacier Point. We met a well-known individual, Hans Hendrik, who had served as hunter and dog driver for several Arctic expeditions. 
He was with Dr. Kane in his ship, The Advance, then with Dr. Hayes in the United States, and then Captain Hall in the Polaris. It was through his skill in hunting that Dr. Kane's party was saved from starvation, and he was the hero of a most thrilling incident in connection with the loss of the Polaris near Littleton Island. The sun was in the west, a good way above the horizon, and a pleasant glow was over sea and land. We steered in a northerly direction for Wilcox Point. Eastward from this point, we observed that the coast trended some miles to a mountain called the Devil's Thumb. Why the Devil's Thumb, rather than the thumb of some respectable character? The sea here is very perilous, and no part of Baffin's Bay is so much dreaded as this locality. Suddenly something in the distance attracted my attention. Looking more carefully, I saw it was an old bear and her two cubs, slowly and cautiously making their way over the ice toward the panther. They came forward, drawn by curiosity, to study carefully the vessel, stopping occasionally, the old one raising her head and snuffing again and again, trying to satisfy herself whether she was safe. We were more fortunate than any previous Arctic voyagers in being able to get a photograph of polar bears in their native ice fields. The bears now took to the water with the intention of reaching the solid flow, but we anticipated them and they wheeled about again to swim to the ice they had abandoned. It might be supposed that men who had once endured the hardship and suffering that beset the Arctic whalers would be unwilling to again face them but it is not so. Those who have once entered these regions and seen this nature in all its wonderful manifestations of beauty and sublimity seem to be drawn back again as with an irresistible fascination. It is to all who enter there the revelation of a new world, a new phase of life and of nature, which is accompanied by the feeling of being in the presence of the eternal God.